Bueno, mi nombre es Felipe, eh, I'm a software engineer at Docker. I joined the company in September last year, that makes it around six months ago. And I'm working remotely from home here, here in Malaga. Uh, I have uh, some other colleagues in the team which are based in, in Paris, in Berlin, and also in the, in the East Coast of the US. Uh, and I'm part of the extensions team at Docker. It's a new team that is at the moment focusing on extending Docker desktop functionality, uh, building APIs and SDK so that other people can contribute and, be, and build things on top of that. So the agenda for today is going to be the following. Uh, we're going to discuss what are the current challenges in team collaboration. Then next, we're going to jump into how we can make our local dev environment reproducible so that everyone in our organization can replicate the same, uh, the same uh, way of working that we have. And then we will continue with a quick demo about uh, how you guys can see how Docker dev environments uh, work. And finally, we're going to have a session, some questions uh, and answers. Okay, so when I was thinking about how to, yeah, thinking about how to onboard people in a company, we have this kind of problem where uh, someone joins the company, uh, this is pretty much the message, hello, welcome to the team, we're happy to have you on board, and then the next thing that happens, someone, if you're a developer, someone, a senior developer will come over and will tell you, hey, here's the documentation that you have to set up uh, to, to set up your environment. And let me know when you're ready. And this is something that <laughs> eventually, after a few hours, your boss or someone will come, come over and will tell you, did you finish writing the software? Uh, no, I spent the last three days setting up my development environment. So you have done nothing? Well, nothing you could understand. I guess that pretty much all of us relate to this situation where you need to go through a document in case that there is any I need to set up every single dependency, every single uh, SDK that you need to work in a, in a given project. Does anyone feel here the same? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so another scenario, which is very, very common, is when we have to review a pull request. Uh, pull requests are used to get changes from other branches into the the master branch, so that we can ship features, fix code, things like that. And this is usually a pain, because what we need to do is, first of all, stash our changes. So we need to switch, as well, the Git branches, so that we can check out the code from our colleague. And then we need to try to run his code in our local machine, right? And what usually happens is that, in some cases, we have to make sure that the dependencies that my colleagues have are the same as the ones that I have in my local machine. And then, if I don't have them, I need to go into my machine and download a new version of the SDK or something like that, download any kind of new tool. And then is when we can start actually reviewing this colleague's code. Finally, once that we have reviewed the code, then we can go back to the previous state where we were and do, again, a git checkout, and start working again in our, in our git branch. So as you can see, here we have a lot of switch, a lot of context switching at the moment between a few branches and, and the other. Um, another scenario is when we have to contribute to open source. I don't know if anyone here makes contributions to open source projects. Anyone? Yeah, a few of them. Cool. Um, so pretty much what we, what we do is to go and check the readme file and find this kind of message that says, check if you have all the requirements uh, for your local environment. And then we have to go through this list and make sure that everything is set up in, lo in our local machine co correctly. Another scenario is if we want to try out new features in a language. So for, for instance, in Go, we have in version 1, 118, we have genetics. And this is a very nice thing that we want to try out, but maybe we don't want to pollute our environment installing different versions from the ones that we are used to. Same happens if you want to try these minimal APIs in .NET 6. 
So these are things that you want to try out, but you don't want to uh, put in your, in your environment. You don't want to mess up your local environment. So how do we make every environment be the same here? How can I make my environment the same as the one from my colleague? So if you remember, we have already solved that kind of problem in the past. When we tried to ship applications <laughs> to production, some of them didn't work. So what we did was to use containers. So we package the application inside a container with all the runtime and dependencies. So this way, we could have this app package and deploy that into everyone else's machine. So, and we, we would expect the same behavior, the same way of running. Has anyone used Docker containers before? Yeah, cool. <laughs> I didn't expect to see <laughs> that many hands up, so that's, that's nice. So that's the, that's the whole idea behind it. We're going to have a dev environment, which is this kind of development container with a very well-defined tool and runtime stack. So we can put any kind of thing that we want in there. For example, if you are developing Angular applications, you can put Angular 13, 12, 11. It's going to depend on the project that you are going to be working on, and the same for the rest of the language. You're going to ship the runtime of that kind of language and also the, the SDK so that you can develop. You can also ship Linux utilities like cool that you get JQ and also some any kind of CLI, like cloud specific CLIs or infrastructure like Terraform. And all this can be shipped in something that we all already know, which is a Docker file, right? Nothing new until this point. So the good benefit of this is that we have a local environment which is gonna be the same for every dev and we can customize it for every project inside the organization. And also, a good benefit of this is that we keep the environment details version in the source code. So we can store it in our Git repo. So I'm gonna, before doing the demo, I'm just gonna quickly show you how this thing actually works and what is the main difference with the local machine setup that you pretty much have at the moment. So here we have our local machine, we have a Ruby version 3.1 installed, and we want to work with another project that requires a different version, okay? Like Ruby 2.7. Usually what we do is to open a directory in the host file system with Visual Studio Code, for instance. And we are targeting this directory. So we are working with the dependencies that we have locally against that folder. But if we think about how to containerize the dev environment, the paradigm here changes. So if you think about it, we have this Docker file, which is gonna sit on a Git repo. And then what's gonna do the Docker dev environments by us automatically is gonna fetch, is gonna create this dev container and it's gonna created based on what is on the specifications that we have told them to, to use. Those in the, in the Docker file that we have specified before. Then it's gonna clone all your source code into a Docker volume, which means that thing is gonna be uh, separated, from, separated from your local folders in your host. So it's isolated in a volume. Then to make this code available inside the container, we're gonna mount the volume. And finally, we're gonna use Visual Studio Code to connect to this container. So, so summarizing, what we are doing here is instead of developing in my machine, I'm developing inside the container. Is the idea kind of clear at this point? Yeah, okay. So let's go to the demo. When I was thinking about creating a cool demo, I thought that it would be great if we could use some kind of project from the GDG organization. So I went into GitHub slash GDG Malaga, and this organization has this kind of repo, which is basically a site template, which is what organizers use to create a, a website to organize these kind of festivals. So this is an example of it, where you can have your schedule, speakers, so everything's here. So 
if I want to contribute to this, to this open source project, what I would normally do is to clone this repo and try to follow the readme with all these instructions, right? So I go here to the part that says local development, and I will follow these instructions. So I have already cloned the project, which is in this local folder, and then I'm going to just install these dependencies, which I, which I already did. And I'm going to try to run this project locally from my host. And it fails. So it fails because <laughs> I have a Ruby version, which is the most recent one, 3.1, that is not compatible with this project for some reason. So the, the, the Jekyll version fails working with this specific version of Ruby. Uh, this is a very common thing if you try to work on different projects in open source, so or in your organization, if you have a lot of microservices of different versions. So we're going to switch the paradigm, the paradigm here, and we're going to use Docker Dev Environment so that we can uh, remove this kind of problem. So we're going to open Docker Desktop. And then on the left menu, we have this Dev Environment tab. Has anyone seen this one before? OK, so this is how you can create a Dev Environment. And when you click on it, you can create one from different sources, and one of them is from a Git repository. OK? So what I did to set up this project according to Docker Dev Environments, I have forked the project. Um, this is now under my GitHub account. And you can see here we have a new, a new directory called .docker. So this is a directory that Docker is going to uh, read and it's going to create the environment based on the configuration that I have here. So I have two files. One of them is the config.json we that we are saying here, I want Docker to read this Docker file and create the environment with that specification. So if, you, if we have a look at the Docker file, first thing that we have is this Ruby 2.7. Why? Because I have checked on Stack Overflow, <laughs> and this is the solution to the problem that they have in the console uh, before. So we need to use Ruby 2.7, and we also need some Node version to be running. OK, so, so far so good. This is a very simple example, but that showcases how you can create some kind of environment for your project. You can put here anything you want. So if you have already built Docker files, then you, you can know that. So what I'm going to do now is going to use this git URL and paste it in here. OK? And I'm going to press continue. And this is now where the magic happens, if it works. <laughs> it's going to create that volume that I showed you before. It's going to clone their source code in there. And it's going to spin up a dev container, just a container with Ruby 2.7. The connection is a bit slow because of the Wi-Fi. Um, do you have any question up to this point? No? OK. Yeah, so you can see here in the logs we have some messages where you can see that it's building exactly the image that we have specified in the Docker file. And then we're going to continue. And we have this small window that tells us open in VS Code. So we're going to just click on it. And this may look a bit silly, but if you have a look at the bottom left corner in the opening remote, Visual Studio Code is not actually opening any local directory in your host. It's connecting to a container. So we, if you have a look here, we have now a container running. So we are targeting that container and connecting to it. So if we open now a terminal, we have one thing interesting here, which is this user, VS Code, and then this ID. This ID is nothing more than the container ID that we have created. 
So we are right now inside this box called a container. Then what we're going to do is to check what version of Ruby we have. If you remember, before we had this version in, on my local host, 3.1.1. And then if I run it inside the container, I have a different version of Ruby that is not conflicting at all with the version that I have on my host. OK, so then if we continue to, to read me, because we are using this from in the Docker file from Ruby, we are going to have already a few tools installed, like Pandel. So I'm just going to proceed with the installation of, the, of these dependencies. I'm not a Ruby developer, so I don't know <laughs> what I'm doing here running these commands, but I'm just following, you know, what any one of us would do normally when trying to contribute to, to open source. Then while this is installing, I can also show you uh, the part of the, of the volumes. So we have inside the container, you can see here, we have a volume, which is this place that Docker has reserved to clone the code. And if we have a look at it, then we can see all the files there. And even more, if I go inside the container and I exec into it, this will open a terminal and I can create a file like this one. And as, oops. Well, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> this is not working now. But anyway, I wanted to show you that if you create a file inside this terminal, the file will appear here because we are working inside this volume. Uh, yeah, but that's not totally important here now. So finally, what we're gonna, what we're gonna do is to execute the final command, jekyll serve w with live reload. So we're gonna just run the project now. Um, as soon as this application starts inside the container, we're going to see that, open, that Visual Studio Code is opening this pop-up saying that there is an app running in port 4000. Then we click on it, and then we have the site up and running. So the only difference that we had with the previous, with the upstream repo, the original one, is that I have a .docker file, a .docker folder in this repo. So if you want to contribute now, you don't need to install anything in your computer. As long as you have Docker Desktop, you are good to go. You can create this environment and start working on, on here. Then, as to, to finish off the demo, um, we're going to try to simulate a change. So this side is, is nice. Uh, but there is one thing that I don't like about it, which is that the page title is on the left. I would like it to be more at the center. So we're going to simulate that we're collaborating with other people here, and I'm going to make this change. So if I go into the top section, I can change the page title and center it a bit. So I'm going to add just some styling. Text align center. I'm going to save this. As soon as I, as I save, this will reload. I have now the title center. If I go to other pages, like this one, Everything seems okay, seems okay, and I'm gonna push that change. And then you may think that this change needs to be pushed using it from outside the container for another terminal, but that's not the case. If we have a look here at the configuration, this container is already communicating with the Git credentials in your host, which means I can create a branch called fix top section And I can add that change. And I can commit it. I can create a commit like fix top section and push it. So the idea is the same. You have your container with everything set up, even with Git. And I didn't even have to install Git because Docker Dev Environment is already doing all this work for you. So now if we go back to GitHub. 
then we have this new branch. So we can you know, come here and create a pull request into my own repo. And then I can come and tell anyone to try this feature. So I'm going to remove, I'm going to close Visual Studio Code. I'm going to remove that dev environment. And now I'm going to create one from this pull request, from this branch. Okay? So I'm going to create a new one. I'm going to copy again the URL. And I'm going to use the add separator to specify the branch that they want to check out. So because we were working in this branch, uh, where's the pull request? The branch name was fix top section. Yeah. So I'm going to put it here, fix slash top section. And I'm going to create a new environment from this branch. OK? And it's going to yeah, repeat the same process, clone the code. All right. Um, by the way, if you try to create a dev environment from a repo that doesn't have this Docker folder, we have some automatic language detection that is going to create a dev environment from the language that you had in that repo, from the main language. So let's open it again. And finally, uh, we need to run the bundle install again. Does anyone know why I need to install these dependencies in the container again? Any, any ideas? Un poco, un poco más fuerte que no. Yeah, effectively. It's because we have a new container, and because it's a new one, the container file system doesn't contain these dependencies. We could put them inside the container and share them with, with another button that we have here that we will show you later on. But at this point, we are just going to, you know, taking baby steps and, and showing the most simple case scenario. Then once that all this is installed, I will run again the jkill command. We are, we are close to the finish. OK. Now if we run check heal, serve, live reload, this is going to open up again in the application in port 4000. We're going to go into the browser. And we're going to click on this page of speakers. And then we should see that change that has happened. So. Even if you now have your laptop here and want to try this out, you can just copy my git URL and this feature branch, and then you're going to see that change without having to install anything. Yeah. So that's, I think that's, that's pretty much the, the demo that I wanted to show you. So just to, to summarize a few key takeaways, uh, with Docker Dev Environments, you can create this Docker container, which is a full feature environment, and you can run Visual Studio Code against to it. Anyone in your company can use it and then just expect the same behavior, so without having the same tooling in your local machine. Um, and we can also share your work in progress with one click. So in the in Docker Desktop, before I show you this share button, so what you can specify here a Docker image. And what this is going to do is going to take a snapshot of the whole container with the dependencies. And you can share this to Docker Hub as a normal image. And then you can create later on another, con another dev environment from that image. So you will go to this existing dev environment, and you can pull and create that container from exactly that image. Even if you put a database on it, anything that you want to put in there.
Okay, so uh, just to finish off, if you want to try this out and you have some issues or some comments, we at Docker are very open to hear you and also include new features and new changes. So that's the, the public uh, repo. Uh, this is the link to the official documentation and a couple of videos about how to create an environment for Go and also for a live stream that I did with one of the Docker captains, uh, internet.6. Internet uh, and then finally, uh, we're hiring at Docker. Uh, we're expanding, we're growing. Uh, Docker is our remote first company which means we don't have offices at the moment, so everyone is working from home. So if you are from Malaga or within Spain, we have these two open positions, which one of them is a front-end software engineer, another is a full-stack position, uh, both in the team that I'm working on. So yeah, I would like to, if you're interested, to apply to these positions. Uh, any question that you have about the talk or this position, feel free to reach me here. I'll be around uh, or send me a DM on Twitter, so yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the talk. And so it's actually, that was interesting. But you showed, what you showed was uh, an instance of the volume on the same port, 4,000. And I was wondering whether I would be able to uh, have at the same time um, an instance running at a four, uh, the port 4,000 and then another uh, environment uh, as a usual Docker uh, dev environment, but pointing to a different port, pass by configuration, so I'm able to have two instances or more of two instances running on different ports, running against different ports yeah. uh, on different branches. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be possible, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So you effectively can. So you can create as many dev containers as you want, but Visual Studio Code is gonna port forward the port in which the application is running inside the container to your local host. So you cannot reuse, let's say, you, you, cannot, you cannot have two environments pointing to the same uh, port on your local host. But what you can do is to use a different port. So as long as, yeah, you can have one branch running in port 4000, another branch running in port 4001, and so on. Yeah. How you can do that is if you go to open in Visual Studio Code, you have here this tab that says ports. And then you can see we have this port here and also this local address. So I guess that there is here a way to change that. Um, and yeah, basically change the port that you want and map it to a, to a different one. But this is, this is the tab that where you need to, to have a look. In fact, if I try now to to create a new environment, because I tried this yesterday at home, <laughs> it's gonna, the, the new environment that I create is gonna try to open a port in port 4000, but because it's gonna be busy, then it's gonna increment it by one. So it's gonna be running 4001 in the next container. Thank you for the question, quite interesting. Yeah, I found this really interesting, uh, but I, I wanted to ask if you could take it a bit forward and just probably remove everything you have in your Redmi and put everything in your Docker file. Is that possible? I mean, that installation you need to do of dependencies. Could you add it in your Docker file and just do it when you run the machine for the first time? Like every command, you don't need to run anything else. Just when you run it, just uh, start the application, right? Yeah, so you want to just, when you create a container, just run on Jekyll serve and, and get it up and Well, not, not even the serve, but the dependency install you did first, you could add it also, no, in the, in the Docker file and install in the, it. In the container file system, yes. I mean, the kind of drawback of that is that the container image is going to increase in size because you're putting more stuff on it, right? But eventually, you can, you can do that. So, for example, if you have some kind of issue and you want someone to exactly have a look at that and replicate the same scenario that you have in your computer, then you, you would ship everything inside that image, all the depths, everything, and then you will share that to someone so that that person can have a look at it and replicate it exactly as the problem that you are having. Because sometimes we try to share things and then some people will tell, okay, this is fine for me, I don't have that problem, I cannot replicate it, yeah? So you can put everything. So it's a Docker file. The only drawback is that you need to be careful because of the image size. Because when you run it, then it's gonna, yeah. Okay, clear. Um, 
Uh, hi, I have a question. I saw that uh, the feature is under preview. I would like to know what is the roadmap for it and uh, if there is any kind of uh, expected cost for businesses to actually implement it. Thank you. You, you mean the roadmap of Docker Dev Environments? Yes. In general? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, at the moment, we have a team dedicated to bring new functionalities into it. We are also uh, interviewing people from you know from from every, every everywhere trying to see how they can find value so things like well i don't use vs code i would like to use uh, JetBrains, for, for instance any kind of other ide yeah so those are the kind of things that uh, we are looking at at the moment so we are reevaluating you know the value of the product and how we can how we can yeah bring more value things that for example are missing at the moment are extensions in in, in Visual Studio Code. So at the moment, we don't have a way. If you have in your local VS Code a few, a, a few extensions, when this new window opens, uh, you will need to install them again. So this is something that we don't have at the moment. So these kind of things to replicate exactly your, your, VS, your VS Code uh, setup is what also we were looking into.